online. So there is also a Zoom uh, link provided. If you're in the room, you're advised not to open Zoom, otherwise we may have funny noises um, that, that, that occur. Uh, it's being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded and, and you're on Zoom, please switch off your camera uh, and your microphone. If you want to ask a question, speak, and you're remote, just use the hand uh, that you wave and, and then we will uh, be able to uh, make sure that you can answer the question. So as Chris explained, we are very privileged to have Kiss uh, as the first speaker. And um, he's going to give a keynote lecture. Please. Um, so we have different kinds of lecture in this in this workshop, keynote lecture that are meant uh, to broaden the view for participants that only know part of the of the field, and then research talks that are more classical uh, recent advice. Please. Well, may I uh, thank the organizers for uh, of this workshop for inviting me to give this introductory lecture. <clears throat> and thank you, Emmanuel, for your kind words of introduction. I was very moved by the uh, words of the uh, deputy director, Chrissy, a moment ago, and showing that photograph quite unexpectedly for me of uh, the occasion in 1998 uh, when uh, I was at Buckingham Palace to receive the Queen's Anniversary Prize on behalf of this institute, uh, together with the Vice Chancellor of the University at that time, Alec Brewers. I was invited also to take seven students uh, of the Newton Institute with me to Buckingham Palace. Of course, we didn't have students, we had in the normal sense, but we did have postdocs. And I selected seven postdocs, all from different countries, to <laughs> accompany me. And uh, it was a very uh, happy occasion. And uh, during the reception, quite an informal reception, the Queen walked around <coughs> um, having a word here and there with, uh, there, there were many uh, winners, I should say, of the Queen's Anniversary Prize, it wasn't only the Newton Institute. Um, but she stopped by one of my students and said in her usual very charming way, and, and what do you do? <laughs> and he said, I study the, uh, the origins of the universe, ma'am. And she took a moment to, <laughs> to understand the implications of this. I don't think she had met anyone before who studied the origins of the universe, but she said, how interesting, <laughs> <laughs> and moved on. <laughs> well, um, I give this lecture in homage to the late Queen Elizabeth. Um, I've modified my title slightly to historical landmarks, precursors of the alpha effect, its uh, origin and limitations. Um, I was asked uh, several years ago to give a one minute lecture on the topic of dynamo theory. <laughs> one minute, yes. That was a, a considerable challenge, even greater than the challenge that faces me now today. Um, so I thought a lot about it and then uh, I, pre I prepared two, just two slides. Uh, one of them I, I show you here, the first slide. Um, uh, if I can move this on, I don't think I can. Nathan, <laughs> why is it not moving on for me? Next or, oh, this. We haven't got that. Ah, here we go. Oh, good. How did you do that? Click on it. And it what do I click on for the next one? That one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. I may call on you again. <laughs> um, this then was the slide that I showed. And you were all very familiar to this audience. But I made the point that uh, what, what is uh, common to these various celestial objects, planets, stars, galaxies, accretion disks, and so on. They rotate. 
they have fluid interiors. The fluids conduct electricity. The diffusion is weak. The fluids are in turbulent convective motion. Coriolis forces make the turbulence helical. And finally, they all have internally generated magnetic fields. And the sixth, uh, there is a consequence of one, two, three, four, and five combined. I should say that the audience was a very mixed audience of postdocs, actually, but from all fields, uh, not only of science, but also the humanities. So I had to put this as well as I could in words um, rather than in, in equations. Well, that was half of my minute. <laughs> well, I may show the, the, the second slide at the end. I'll keep that to the end of this lecture also. So here's the plan of this uh, talk. <clears throat> Firstly, some historical landmarks, pre-1965. Then the mean field approach to the dynamo problem, which has, to my mind, dominated the development of the subject in subsequent years. Uh, then I'll describe a Beltrami dynamo, uh, again, matters that are probably familiar to all of you, and uh, its relevance for Earth and planets. And at the other extreme, much more problematic, as we know, the uh, extreme of high magnetic Reynolds number and uh, the relevance for sun, stars, and galaxies. Uh, I want to comment on uh, the possibility of weakly helical turbulence. That is when the magnitude of the alpha in the alpha effect is much less than the magnitude of the beta, the uh, effectively the, the turbulent diffusivity divided by the scale of the turbulence, L, which I'll call L0. Um, then some comments on a method for determining alpha and beta. One possible approach to the theoretical determination of alpha and beta when Rm is large, the difficult limit, the renormalization group determination. Um, <clears throat> then uh, I have to comment on the key problem of what's described as catastrophic alpha quenching and related beta quenching, the, uh, the, the suppression of alpha and beta effects as the magnetic field or magnetic energy increases under dynamo action. And finally, uh, insofar as time permits, I'll talk about magnetostrophic turbulence in the context of the geodynamo, um, the various issues that arise, helicity, the alpha effect, buoyancy flux, Reynolds stresses, and so on. Um, okay, let's see if it, there we go. So the historical backdrop, <clears throat> it goes back very early, 11th mm -hmm. century, the great Shen Kua, um, uh, a philosopher, really, um, of the uh, Song Dynasty, uh, who uh, quoted about uh, what we now see as declination of the Earth's magnetic field. Here's the quote from his Dream Pool essays. Around 1088, magicians rub the needle, the point of a needle, with the lodestone. Then it is able to point to the south, south, not north. That's just because of the way they uh, manufactured their needles, of course. But it always inclines slightly to the east and does not point directly to the south. So the declination of the Earth's magnetic field was known, at least to the Chinese, more than 900 years ago, implying some kind of non axis symmetry uh, uh, in the Earth system. Uh, well, we jump a few centuries, and here is Ed, Edmund Haley um, of Comet fame. Um, the secular variation of the Earth's field was well known by that time to navigators of the 15th and 16th centuries, particularly to Christopher Columbus, uh, which uh, probably affected his, uh, his destination across the Atlantic. <clears throat> anyway, uh, later in 1692, Haley considered the possible causes, and I quote here from his uh, publication, 
the external parts of the globe may well be reckoned as the shell and the internal as a nucleus or inner globe contained within ours with a fluid medium between. Only this outer sphere having its turbinating, I think he meant spinning motion, some small matter, either swifter or slower than the inner half. Well, we now know that the uh, inner core, the inner solid core of the earth is in fact spinning at a slightly different rate, probably all the time from the mantle. So this was in a way a prophetic vision. Well, then we come to the 19th century and three great uh, scientists, time of great uh, scientific expansion, Ampere, who recognized that the Earth's field is produced by toroidal current in the Earth's core. Uh, Gauss, of course, the great Gauss, who developed the spherical harmonic decomposition of the Earth's field, leading to the technique by which secular variation of the field could be quantified, uh, a technique that was uh, exploited brilliantly by um, Bloxham, Gubbins, and Jackson in 1989 to find contours of the radial field uh, at the core mantle boundary at different epochs. Um, and then Faraday, uh, the, <clears throat> who discovered the law of induction, the Copley Medal of the Royal Society citation uh, wrote, he, in other words, Faraday, gives indisputable evidence of electric action due to terrestrial magnetism alone. An important addition is thus made to the facts which have long been accumulating for the solution of that most interesting problem, the magnetism of the earth. Then we come to the great James Clark Maxwell. And I show here the portrait uh, that hangs in the hall of Trinity College here in Cambridge. In his uh, treatise, 1873, uh, um, uh, you can find the following quotation. What cause, whether exterior to the earth or in its inner depths, can produce such enormous changes in the earth's magnetism? And of course, he's talking again about the secular variation. These immense changes in so large a body force us to conclude that we are not yet acquainted with one of the most powerful agents in nature, the scene of whose activity lies in those inner depths of the earth, to the knowledge of which we have so few means of access. I can almost hear his voice uh, uh, rolling his eyes as he, <laughs> he makes this sort of statement. <clears throat> He lectured here in the Senate House on uh, his electromagnetic theory. And uh, I think nobody actually understood him at the time, uh, but this is the sort of statement that he may well have made. The means of access to which he refers were later provided by the science of seismology, of course. And on this basis, Harold Jeffries in 1926 wrote, the central core is probably fluid but its viscosity is unknown. I think that is pretty well still the case, although we get improving estimates of the viscosity is still very small relative to other diffusivities all the time. And then Inge Lehmann, 1936, in a paper with the shortest title ever, a single letter, P prime, there is the prime. That is the title of her paper she gave evidence for the existence of a solid inner core. Ah, sorry, I don't have the date of her death. She is, um, but um, okay. Um, then uh, into the 20th century, Schuster in his uh, lecture, presidential address to the Physical Society of London, uh, he again discussed uh, the origin of the Earth's magnetic field, and he wrote, the difficulties which stand in the way of basing terrestri terrestrial magnetism on electric currents in the Earth's interior 
are insurmountable. That was in spite of the earlier comments of, um, of uh, predictions, you might say, of Ampere. Even as late as 1940, Chapman and Bartel in their great uh, treatise on uh, geomagnetism came to the same defeatist conclusion. That was 1940. And that was in spite of the um, uh, exciting and rather courageous um, suggestion of Larmor in 1919 concerning uh, a self the possibility of a self-exciting dynamo, which involved this uh, dynamo cycle that uh, electromagnetic induction, Faraday's induction, uh, could generate electric current from a pre-existing weak magnetic field. And that current by Ampere's law would possibly regenerate the magnetic field that you start with. But then Cowling put a damper on this whole idea with his uh, anti-dynamo theorem in 1933, uh, his theorem that axisymmetric dynamo action was impossible. Um, uh, that, I think, contributed to the Chapman and Bartel uh, uh, defeatist conclusion in 1940. But then let me jump temporarily to post-1970, uh, call it the volt fass uh, total change uh, of, uh, of opinion, of scientific opinion generally, as recorded in two books of that period, the book of Cook, uh, interiors of the planets in 1980, where he wrote, there is no theory other than a dynamo theory that shows any signs of accounting for the magnetic fields of the planets. And the book of Jacobs on uh, reversals of the Earth's magnetic field, where he writes, there has been much speculation and so on, the only possible means seems to be some form of electromagnetic induction electric currents flowing in the Earth's core. Um, well, let me go back to the beginning of the reign of the late Queen Elizabeth. Her reign, 1953 to 2022. And early during that reign, we have the, again, brilliant uh, imaginative paper of Eugene Parker, 1955, uh, <clears throat> concerning cyclonic events. Um, and this uh, is the sort of picture that emerges, a rising twisting blob uh, that can give rise to current anti-parallel to the pre-existing magnetic field, J equal to alpha B. However, the difficulty as you see is if you just go on twisting, you can get uh, the same J equals alpha B, but with alpha positive rather than negative. So the question arises, well, what is the sign of alpha? And this is an indication of the difficulty in determining alpha when the magnetic Reynolds number is large. When it's small, it's that uh, left hand uh, action that presumably dominates. Um, but um, Cowling in his Interscience uh, text in 1957, I'm interested to see that uh, Peter Davidson has a copy of it right here. Um, the argument is not altogether satisfactory, he writes. Uh, a more detailed analysis is really needed. Parker does not attempt such an analysis. His mathematical discussion is limited to elucidating, I would say not very clearly in my view, the consequences if his picture of what occurs is accepted. <clears throat> but clearly his suggestion deserves a good deal of attention, which it has certainly received over the last half century. I just remind you of the Parker Solar Probe, probe launched in 2018. This is just an artist's concept of the uh, probe. And um, much more recently, in fact, just six days ago, the, um, one of the wonderful photos from the James Webb Telescope, um, two days before the death of the Queen. 
So her reign really did, did uh, span an extraordinary range of uh, developments in dynamo theory and in related observations. Um, I just comment briefly on uh, Braginsky's nearly axisymmetric dynamo. I think this was a very important paper in 1964. It was a second precursor to the mean field electrodynamics that followed two years later. Uh, nearly axisymmetric theory bypassing Cowling, Cowling's anti-dynamo theorem and leading to not J equals alpha B, but um, J equals alpha B for the toroidal component of electric current. That was important because it regenerated the meridian, meridional magnetic field and uh, Briginsky did have differential rotation in his theory as an important part of his uh, dynamo. So in a way that was the alpha omega dynamo that he was describing. It was a very, very difficult paper to read and um, it was much elucidated in later equally brilliant work of Soward in 1972, who recognized the mixed Lagrangian Eulerian character of the theory thus explaining the origin of Braginsky's effective variables, which seemed to come out in a sort of magic way in uh, Braginsky's theory. Um, well, we come to what I described as the watershed in dynamo theory, 1966, the paper of Steinbeck, Krauss and Radler, published in German, in uh, East Germany, as it was at that time, in which the alpha effect, J equals alpha B, was put on a reasonably firm basis in uh, this paper. And I show you one of the pictures from the paper involving flux tube linkage. So they were aware that the magnetic field that is generated by their alpha effect has a certain topological linkage associated with it. <clears throat> I published a paper in 1970 on this uh, same type of theory involving the alpha effect. And uh, uh, I wrote, in fact, as the opening, um, the opening uh, sentence of that paper, a theory that is likely to be of the greatest significance in geomagnetism and in cosmical electrodynamics has been developed recently by Steinbeck, Krauss and Redler, 1966. And again, I believe that that statement has been well justified by what has followed in subsequent decades. Uh, these uh, papers of Steinbeck, Krauss and Radler became well known in the West only when they were finally translated by Paul Roberts and uh, Roberts and Sticks in 1972. Um, well, mean field electrodynamics, I just uh, summarize it extremely briefly. It requires scale separation. I use L0 as the scale of the energy containing eddies of turbulence or possibly a background random wave field and capital L much greater than L0 as the scale of uh, the dynamo generated magnetic field. The mean electromotive force that is generated U cross B then evo uh, is shown to um, involve a series of this kind. It's a rapidly convergent series if the capital L is sufficiently large. And there's the alpha term at the beginning and then beta term. And if um, the turbulence or the random wave field is isotropic, simplest situation, then alpha ij is alpha delta ij, beta ij, beta epsilon ij k where alpha is a pseudo scalar and beta is a pure scalar. Beta appears here in curly and it turns out to be just an eddy diffusivity. I've written it as greater than zero. And uh, there are um, papers that show that beta can be less than zero. But I think in that case, as we know, particularly if the beta is less than zero and overwhelms the natural diffusivity, eta, uh, then um, the problem is essentially ill-posed because the very small scale ingredients will blow up 
extremely rapidly. So it, uh, these, these papers worry me a lot. So I assume that beta must be positive for self-consistency of this main field approach. But alpha, the leading term in the series, is non-zero being a pseudo-scalar only if the turbulence is chiral. In other words, if it lacks reflection symmetry. Well, uh, the simplest situation is uh, uh, what I describe as a Beltrami dynamo. Uh, and this is really when RM, I suppose for the moment it's small compared with one's limited uh, of order one, if you like, but not large. Then uh, the helicity, the mean helicity of the background field has a spectrum. It's the integral of a spectrum h of k dk, and alpha is a weighted integral of this spectrum, simply with a weight factor k to the minus two. And it is then of order L0 squared over three eta times h. And the beta, if you work it out, turns out to be rm squared of order rm squared times eta. In other words, negligible compared with eta molecular diffusivity. Well, now, if we take curl B to be KB, a Beltrami field with K a constant, and it has to be a small constant, then dB by dt, the induction equation, alpha curl B plus eta del squared B is alpha KB minus eta K squared B. It admits exponentially growing solutions with the growth exponent p alpha k minus eta k squared, a parabola with a range of positive values for sufficiently small capital K. In other words, sufficiently large length scale of the growing field. Km, the maximum, is alpha over two eta. And that Km times L zero is also of order Rm squared, small. So the theory is consistent, this consistent with the initial assumption of a uh, separation of scales. Uh, I should just comment very briefly that uh, it's often stated that, you know, if H is, uh, there are situations where helicity is, uh, is non-zero, but alpha is zero. And that is true. It's just because there's that weighting factor in the integral. I give simple example here, H, depending on a parameter A, not to be confused with alpha here, then uh, um, when that parameter A is one, uh, you get the blue curve. That is the helicity spectrum. And when it is actually just a little bigger than A, 1.08, you get the red curve. But when it's one, H is zero and alpha is non-zero, but negative. And that may be a little bit of a surprise. You could have zero helicity, but non-zero alpha, but not a zero helicity spectrum. That is what matters really. And here, uh, uh, alpha is 1.08. When H is negative, alpha is zero. Well, that's trivial, but I think these situations really are exceptional. They involve very, very special uh, um, helicity spectrum functions. Um, so let's now go to the other extreme, much more problematic, Rm large compared with one. It's generally assumed that in a maximally helical situation, alpha in magnitude, of course, it can be positive or negative, but in magnitude, it's of order u0 and beta of order u0, l0 is much greater than eta. The uh, beta is the eddy diffusivity, and that's going to dominate over molecular diffusivity in this limit. But this gives, if we follow the Beltrami approach, Km of order alpha over two beta turns out to be of order uh, one over two l0. So the scale of growth of the magnetic field is of the same order as the scale of the background field. It's not large. And so there's an inconsistency. This is incompatible with the two scale treatment. 
as suggesting that we're not dealing in this limit. We can't deal in this limit with uh, a two scale dynamo. It's necessarily a small scale dynamo. This, uh, of course, is worrying because uh, you have a very large RM, for example, in the sun. Um, you certainly have small scale dynamo. You have magnetic field fluctuations on all observable scales. Um, but nevertheless, there is a mean magnetic field, which is non zero on the scale of the whole sun itself. Um, and uh, how can that be? Well, if the turbulence is only weakly helical, and there I suppose alpha of order epsilon u zero rather than u zero, where epsilon is just some small parameter. That gives L of order L0 over epsilon, large compared with L0. That can now be consistent. So the two scale dynamo can survive in this situation, even in stellar and possibly interstellar context. <clears throat> well, let me describe briefly one approach for determining alpha and beta, <clears throat> um, which I uh, suggested way back in 1982, I think it was, um, but uh, it, uh, um, it is really quite difficult to really formalize and tighten the argument. However, it involves thinking of the energy spectrum as being discretized in some way in the sum of elements that you can take a bite of one at a time. Um, so you discretize and compute alpha and beta calculated by taking successive bytes, starting from k equals infinity. So way out here, I hope my arrow is, yes, it is showing up. You take a byte at which um, the scale is small and the magnitude of u is small. So the RM is small, and you can use RM small theory um, for the first byte. That gets you started. Then you take the second byte and repeat the process. Well, that second byte is a little bit different from the first byte because there is now an alpha effect acting on the mean magnetic field. But you can follow through the process with the second byte, and then you find that you're into a cycle. The third byte involves exactly the same equation as did the second byte. And uh, you can therefore imagine repeating the process. And this is the renormalization approach. Uh, <clears> that <throat> gives two equations, coupled equations for alpha as a function of the k where you reach in this process and also beta of k. There are coupled equations and you need to take both of them together. Well, I show the result of that simply for an H of K, well, this is E of K. E of K I've taken to be a rather a sensible choice that is K fourth for very small K and falls off like K to the um, uh, minus five thirds, I think it was. Um, uh, in other words, a Kolmogorov type spectrum. And H of K, I took to be one quarter of the maximum that it could be. It must always be less than 2K, E of K, for reasons of realizability. So I took it to be just a quarter of that. So that's my epsilon. It's not terribly small, but just so that you can see the results. And then the beta of K coming in from infinity rises and actually asymptotes. Uh, I've normalized things, so it asymptotes a bit less than one. And alpha is negative because I took H of K to be positive. Alpha negative, it increases negatively and asymptotes to something a bit less than 0.2. In other words, in magnitude about a quarter of beta. The RM we can compute, RM is K E of K, to the half, well, here we are, uh, k to the minus one, divided by, now it's not just divided by eta, it's divided by eta plus beta, it's helped by the eddy diffusivity at each stage of the argument. And we've used this weekly helical assumption. Um, 
And uh, here is how Rm uh, behaves, uh, computed from these two coupled equations. Rm, well, it rises and it rises to order one asymptotes at 1.4. Well, that's not bad. Usually Rm equal to 1.4, you assume is small. It's small enough to apply low Rm theory with some confidence. So I, I remain reasonably confident about that approach, which I think does need to be developed with uh, greater rigor than I was capable of. Now some comments on alpha quenching. When B grows as a result of the alpha effect, it tends to suppress this uh, alpha effect leading to saturation. This is what's known as alpha quenching since the work of Weinstein and Catania, 1992. For example, the expression that is often used, although I haven't quite found the origin of this particular choice, alpha equals alpha zero divided by one plus Rm. I've used this for magnetic energy density, M of T, divided by kinetic energy. I'm using, uh, forget the factor a half, M of T over U zero squared. Um, uh, but the Rm here is the important thing, which suggests that when M is of order um, one over Rm, in other words, very small, you have this very strong damping effect. That is what's meant by actually known as catastrophic quenching. Suggests saturation when M is of order Rm to the minus one, potentially fatal in astrophysical context. Well, I put a question mark. Uh, but I quote from Charbonneau, his review article in 2014. This result, which came to be known as catastrophic quenching, <clears throat> has profound implications for astrophysical dynamos in general, because in most astrophysically relevant situations, Rm much larger than one, implying saturation of large fields, it implies, at a factor Rm to the half, smaller than equipartition. In the solar interior, Rm is of order 10 to the power 10. So that indeed would be uh, catastrophic for mean field dynamo theory in the sun. However, all is not lost because beta is also quenched as uh, pointed out also by Weinstein and Catania. In fact, they started their paper uh, on the beta quenching effect. <clears throat> Here I've taken the weakly heli helical, helical situation. So alpha zero, epsilon near zero. And, uh, but I'll take alpha to be this, this alpha zero divided by one plus Rm times M of T. I'm here normalizing things. So U zero and L zero are both equal to one. That's fixing time and length scales. That's all. And beta, I take to be beta zero over also quenched in the same way. Quenching them in the same way seems to make sense because after all, alpha zero is, involves u zero, beta zero involves the same u zero. So if we damp out u zero, the turbulent fluctuations by a growing magnetic field, then it's going to affect alpha and beta in the same way. Um, so I take these and now look at a Beltrami mode again. Curl B equals KB. The equation for the magnetic energy density, dm by dt, is actually very simple, first order differential equation, which can be integrated um, without difficulty analytically. Um, but you have a K alpha zero here, and then you have minus K squared times beta zero times the same M with the quenching factor. And then you have the natural ohmic diffusion factor. Integrating that equation gives this result, a magnetic energy which doesn't saturate at order one over Rm, it actually grows very slowly. It grows very slowly, but reaches equipartition level. And uh, the asymptotic behavior is one minus that's equipartition minus an exponential minus two k squared. K is small, necessarily. It's the small k we chose in relation to the epsilon here. And uh, 
Rm is large. So this is a very slow approach to uh, equipartition. Uh, <clears throat> this may be compared with some difficulty <laughs> to the picture from the pa paper of uh, uh, Catania and David Hughes, who's here in our audience. And I hope he'll be commenting on this perhaps in his lecture. Um, um, from 1996. This was uh, the first Galloway Proctor flow in which time dependence was <coughs> essential, but a space periodic dynamo at uh, RM and, and Reynolds number both equal to 100. I took RM equals 100 here also. Um, and a similar growth as I have here, but a growth of magnetic energy and uh, here approaching equipartition. But this is a small scale dynamo. And whereas this is a mean field dynamo uh, growing on a much larger length scale. So I don't think there's a conflict. There are similarities which are interesting and again that need to be pursued. Now, in the time that remains to me, how much time do I have in my little time? Well, I have time to come down to earth again and talk a little bit about the approach involving magnetostrophic turbulence with relevance particularly to the geodynamo. This of course is just an artist's sketch to liven up the slide a little bit. Well, this is based on the following, you might say hypotheses. One, the earth is slowly cooling and the solid inner core is growing by slow solidification of the liquid outer core freezing of the liquid outer core onto the solid inner core. Buoyant elements are released from the mushy zone at this inner core boundary, uh, whose thickness is usually estimated to be of order of one kilometer, giving rise to convection that is primarily compositional in character. Of course, it's influenced no doubt by thermal effects as well. The energy containing scale, now I apologize here, I should be using L0 for consistency, but I forgot and I didn't have time to change this. So this capital L is now the energy containing scale of the resulting convection, which I estimate to be in the range one to 100 kilometers, much smaller than the depth of the liquid, um, inner uh, outer core. Um, the reason I choose that range <laughs> is to ensure that the RM is of order one, not too large. But it seems reasonable because after all, these um, the instability is arising from a mushy zone of thickness one kilometer. Of course, there may be large but you think of blobs arising from, and that was the approach that David Loper and I first uh, tried to consider blobs, which we assume to be spherical rising through the liquid core. But that was followed by a paper by St. Pierre very quickly, who did a computation of such a spherical blob and found it was subject to a slicing instability. So our assumption that a blob would, could re retain its form uh, was more or less shot to pieces. So now I make no such assumption. I simply assume that there is a random buoyancy distribution, but that it has a scale in uh, the range, one to a hundred, probably a hundred kilometers is uh, nearer the truth of the matter. Theta. Uh, the buoyancy uh, delta rho over rho is extremely small, of order three times 10 to the minus nine. And the characteristic velocity of the rising elements is of order 0.3 millimeters per second. These are estimates that are, they may be revised in the course of this program, <coughs> but they're the estimates that I have found in the literature. Five, that implies that the Rossby number is extremely small the inertia, conventional inertia, is negligible on this scale. Coriolis forces are dominant. Rm is of order one or less. Um, when I say of order one, it might be 10. That wouldn't worry me. The Reynolds number is 
very large compared with one. And as long as we're far from the boundaries, viscosity is negligible, can be neglected. It's not difficult to include viscosity, but uh, it has little effect. Um, so uh, length, our length L is bounded below and above. We can uh, linearize the Navier-Stokes equation and the induction equation. The important remaining nonlinearity is in the convection of buoyancy, u dot grad theta. Seven, up-down symmetry breaking turns out to be essential to provide helicity and an alpha effect. I'll say what I mean by this up-down symmetry breaking in a moment. Buoyant blobs rise, they don't fall. Well, that's what I mean. <laughs> It's obvious the buoyant blobs are going to rise and fluid will slowly subside around them. So there's a breakdown in the symmetry between up and down. It's a bit like the situation as described when, when topological pumping is involved. There it's the downward welling regions that are connected and can carry magnetic field down in the solar context. Um, finally, a Reynolds stress distribution associated with the convection drives flow, which is primarily differential rotation. That's associated when you have convection and rising, there's a conservation of angular momentum, which presumably is what gives rise to differential rotation. <clears throat> well, uh, the alpha effect in magnetostrophic turbulence, I, here I show this famous picture from the uh, paper of Glatzmeier and Roberts in 1995, the first very successful uh, pioneering computation, DNS, of uh, geomagnetism. Let B be a B0 plus, uh, in other words, mean field plus fluctuation, and I use alpha in units, and then the equation of motion involves just Coriolis pressure, of course, <clears throat> augmented by magnetic pressure, uh, magnetic Lorentz force, and buoyancy. And the induction equation linearize because Rm is of order unity uh, with these divergence conditions. We regard theta, sorry, as statistically given with its spectrum function known. We don't really know it, but it's a little bit like kin kin kinematic dynamo theory, but we've moved a step further on. We're assuming the statistics of theta is known, but we are considering dynamics here and uh, induction equation. Well, we can work out U and B as linear functionals of theta because these two equations were, these two equations are linear if theta is a sort of known forcing. They're linear in U and B. So uh, we can then compute U cross B and we can get the helicity from that. Uh, the helicity spectrum function I show here, and the total he mean helicity is given by this integral over both k and omega. The omega, the time dependence, is essential in the induction equation, even although I've linearized it. Uh, it's that that gives the, uh, I don't know, it's the phase lag that's needed between u and b to give a non-zero helicity and a non-zero alpha effect. Um, this relates a little bit to Braginsky's old theory because there's a factor in the denominator here, D, which I show here. And if the diffusivities are zero, if eta is zero, in other words, then uh, this is um, the dispersion relation for magnetostrophic waves or Mach waves as Braginsky would describe them. So you're, you can have a resonance associated with that when you integrate over. It rather depends on the form of the helicity spectrum, whether you get a resonance or not. But anyway, hence alpha, it's the same, but uh, I had before a one. It's now because we've got time dependence, this is the formula relating alpha to helicity. And quenching is evident in the expression for d, when you take d squared, you see there's b zero to the power of four here. 
So d squared, it'll be to the power eight, but we've got a b squared here. So we end up with alpha going like b to the power minus six. That's if there's no resonance involved, but that's a very strong quenching, obviously. Um, well, that gives you a helicity and uh, an alpha effect, which is capable of generating an alpha squared dynamo, but we really want differential rotation in there as well. And that involves driving by Reynolds stress, which can also be calculated, computed as an integral over the spectrum function gamma. Um, and there's a similarly a magnetic Reynolds stress like alpha, these can be expressed weighted integrals of a gamma. And then you have a mean flow, capital U, which would be driven by the gradient of these Reynolds stresses. So we should include uh, that term in the induction equation, which we didn't. We didn't have a mean flow to start with. So really this should be regards the start of some kind of iterative process <clears throat> to get an improved theory. Um, well, determination of gamma, I say I, there's the rub to quote from Shakespeare. We have a buoyancy flux, the average of u z theta, that can be estimated and it should be the same at every level z. So that's a constraint. Um, and then we have theta satisfying an equation and the u of theta is linear in theta. So it's an active, an active um, scalar equation of a rather interesting kind. You can work out an equation for what I <clears throat> describe as theturgy rather than energy. Um, and uh, it suggests a cascade of this quantity, uh, giving a spectrum um, k to the minus five thirds, a Kolmogorov type spectrum. But again, this is really rather very speculative and it's an area where much more work is needed. Well, I come to my final slide, modified a little since uh, the lecture I gave a few years ago, um, but I, this is my mantra, um, convection and diffusion by interbalance with helicity yields order from confusion in cosmic electricity. That uh, little poem is, by the way, published in my book, if I can, our book, our good chairman here, which should be available on the desk out there before the week is out, I hope. Um, and uh, that brings me to the end of my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Keith, for this brilliant introductory lecture. We now have time for questions. Don't be shy, please, Dave. Um, you talked about two limits, the small magnetic Reynolds number, large magnetic Reynolds number based on um, a scale, a small scale. Um, when I look at the universe, I see a continuum uh, going from Earth through Jupiter to uh, brown dwarfs, low mass stars that are fully convective. And that covers the entire range. And I see similarities in the field. And yet you were talking about the two limits as if they were in some sense quite different. Is it that we have some kind of universality in the behavior uh, or what? Um, could it be that you don't actually have this separation? Could it be, for example, that when we talk about the Earth, you're never really talking about small magnetic Reynolds number. Now, of course, there is a scale at which the magnetic Reynolds number is small, but, but at the larger scale is not. So, so my question is, are you thinking that there's some kind of universality or do you th really think that there are two classes? Well, thank you for that question. They uh, good question. Uh, I, I do think there's uh, some kind of universality in the fact that an alpha effect exists and a beta effect for that matter. 
Um, but of course, the magnitude of these effects and the importance of these effects uh, relative to other effects, and in particular to differential rotation, um, can, can vary quite dramatically from one context to another. And we do see the variation. After all, in the sun, we know that the main dipole field um, follows the sunspot cycle, so it has a period of the order of 22 years. Whereas in the case of the Earth, well, we have random reversals, but they're separated by something of the order of 10,000 years. So it's more like a steady uh, dynamo in the context of the Earth. And uh, we'll hear more about the planets later in this workshop. Um, uh, um, but for the Earth, it's quasi steady, but then with these random reversals that are triggered in some way, uh, and I have some ideas about that, um, but that's even more speculative. Um, so, yes, um, limited universality, I think, is the answer. Thank you. Yeah, Johannes. So I have a kind of a follow-on question to Dave. Um, so this, this length scale, I mean, what defines this length scale where rm is one or of order one Sorry, the length scale so this length you called it l0 the question is what defines this length scale for a given system is that do you know Sorry, what defines the length scale l0 what um, defines the length scale is that well that i guess you assume it's a that's a very big question uh, i like to estimate it uh, for the earth because yeah. we, if, if the origin is eruption from the mushy zone, um, that may be entirely different for other planets. Um, and uh, as far as the sun is concerned, well, we can observe the, uh, the great range of scales on the surface, but I would think that the granulation scale or the even the smaller than granulation scale is, is, is a good starting point. So, so that's a typical length scale for your convection for your flow, which dominates the flow, right? I guess that's what you assume. But is this necessarily the length scale where most of the magnetic field is generated? Uh, again, I'm afraid the acoustics of that gadget it's, is, what? Uh, it makes me unable to hear. Okay. Is, yes. This length scale is, is the dominant scale of the flow, right? Yes. Right? The dominant scale of the random ingredient of the flow. Right. Yes. You can observe probably if you could well, for a planet or for any other system. Uh, but is this necessarily the length scale where most of the magnetic field is generated? Um, well, I don't. I don't know, frankly, because the answer to that. Rm one, so that means diffusion equals generation. But there could be other length scale where more magnetic field is generated. Yes. Yes, I really, I, I don't know. I mean, we know that in a, if you take a, a sphere and, and take a very regular motion inside the sphere. Oh, but you use, usually have to include an alpha effect again with a regular um, distribution of alpha, then you can get a dynamo, all sorts of dynamos. But the question is what determines the alpha? Because the alpha effect is, is usually essential in these models. And um, so that is my, my focus, really. What determines the alpha and what scale is operative in determining that alpha? Yeah, yes. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. A question following up on this uh, universality problem. You mentioned, um, uh, you described as exceptional situations where uh, elicity is non-zero and uh, the alpha effect is uh, zero. Yeah. But maybe this, uh, well, what's your feeling about these exceptional situations playing a role in uh, explaining departures from uh, universality? Like for instance, I don't know, mandar minimum, yeah. say. Well, it's just, uh, as I would say, that situation, the, the generic situation is when helicity is non-zero, 
alpha is non-zero. And they generally have opposite signs. So that's generic. Now, these are just exceptional situations when one is zero and the other is non-zero, quite exceptional. And it would be astonishing. I mean, it would be amazing if it turned out to be the case <laughs> for one of the planets out there <laughs> or an exoplanet somewhere. There are so many of them, it just might be the case. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Since the number is so high, we, we can observe these yes, exceptions. Exactly. Or you might be near to that situation. Exactly. Any question maybe in the back of the room? Yes. Daniel. Could you, uh, could you comment on uh, some of the work on um, off diagonal terms of the uh, beta tensor and uh, its ability to generate uh, dynamos, for instance, by comment edge. on which terms the uh, off, um, oh, off, the other off, terms off, off diagonal terms of the beta tensor. Uh, the the non isotropic terms. Right? Yes. Oh yeah. Well, there's a great deal written about that. As far as alpha is concerned, it can have a um, an anti-symmetric ingredient which actually involves a quasi drift, a drift of the magnetic field, uh, which simply can add to any mean field that you have, or it, it is a mean velocity. Um, that's an interesting point, actually. It, it, uh, but I don't think it would be large enough to generate a, an adequate differential rotation, for example. The beta being a third rank tensor is is very complicated. There are all sorts of um, different possibilities there, which have been very much explored in many papers by uh, Radler, particularly in, uh, and I should have pointed out that Radler sadly died just two years ago. There was a meeting in uh, in Potsdam. Did I say two, two years ago he died? The meeting in Potsdam was just about a month ago to celebrate his life. He published many papers uh, on effects associated with the beta term. Um, and uh, they're, they're complex and interesting and can in themselves uh, generate dynamo action. Yes, no, I couldn't possibly have covered them in this time available, but yeah, there's a lot written about that. Yes. Maybe I can just ask for a second about the Babcock Lenin type framework and where the alpha is um, related to the flux emergence. How does this fit in? Or any comments? Sorry, alpha, any comments on the Babcock Lenin type dynamo where the alpha is associated with flux emergence? When it's associated with uh, flux emergence. Sorry. Flux oh, flux emerging. Uh, are you talking about the Earth or the Sun? The flux emerging from the Sun. <clears throat> um, well, you're outside the region, the regime of uh, dynamo generation. Once you're in the emergent region, I I wouldn't regard it as essential for the dynamo. I think if you my feeling is if you if you were brave enough to put a perfectly conducting rigid boundary around the photosphere, then the dynamo would still uh, would still exist in the interior. Oh well, <laughs> it would be very different because you you'd certainly you wouldn't have an external um, dipole or quadrupole or or whatever. There'd be no external field at all, um, but there would be a dynamo. Sorry, regarding the cycle yes. or the uh, or I see the solar the um, the sunspot cycle and all that. I I think it still would be a periodic dynamo in the interior. <laughs> Raising interesting discussions during the program. Um, any other question? If not, let's thank Kiss again for the talk. Thank you very much, Kiss.
And um, before we have the coffee break, I'd like to correct a mistake. I did introduce the, the workshop organizers, but not the program organizers. So uh, besides Uli and myself, Peter Davidson, Matt Browning and Chris Jones are in the room. And um, the program is running until mid-December. So uh, 